case two, and I'll load up the next one here. Okay, case two is a 40-year-old woman with a mass in the axilla. Oh, here, maybe I have to refresh it. There we go. 40-year-old woman with a mass in the axilla, and it's a huge slab of tissue here that we're dealing with, or multiple slabs. So these are huge, almost inclusion-like uh, structures, and these are actually massive nucleoli in these tumor cells. And we've got large eosinophilic cells with abundant cytoplasm here. Let's look at some other areas. It's got a lot of different patterns to, to see. Over here, it's kind of like solid sheet-like growth. Does anyone know what, um, what cytologic feature that what, what we would call these cells, these cells that have these centric nuclei and a bunch of eosinophilic cytoplasm kind of forming a pink blob here that pushes the nucleus to the side. I would call those rhabdoid. Very good. Yes, those are rhabdoid cells. And, and a rhabdoid cell is not a specific cell type. It's a cytologic pattern that can be seen in a variety of different things. And to my eye, rhabdoid and plasma cytoid are kind of closely uh, similar thing. Some people define rhabdoid to be strictly when it has like the pink globule. Um, some of these don't really have that, um, but um, uh, in any case, I feel like they are very much overlapping plasma cytoid cells and rhabdoid cells. Look at the pleomorphism, just wild atypia in this tumor. Okay, so what kind of tumor might this be or what kind of stains would you, would you do here? Here's the, those big Big eosinophilic rhabdoid cells here, huge, massive ones. There, that's the kind of eosinophilic globule. See how it's making a big ball of pink? So usually that ball it corresponds to a tangle of some sort of intermediate filament that's clumped up there and that's bulged up next to and pushing the nucleus to the side. So I would, I would get an I and I one. Great idea. INI1 can be lost, and it can be lost in a growing list of different tumors. So the, the main one that I think of is epithelioid sarcoma, but there's another tumor called rhabdoid tumor. That is, uh, there's several types. There's rhabdoid tumor of the brain. There's a renal one uh, in the brain. It's called atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumor. There's one in the kidney. And then there's uh, extra renal rhabdoid tumors. And they show overlap with a form of epithelioid sarcoma called proximal type, a really ugly, cytologically ugly, a highly malignant looking and very rhabdoid looking tumor type. And those are gonna usually express keratin and EMA and have loss of nuclear INI1 expression. So that's one thing we can think of is rhabdoid tumor or um, epithelioid sarcoma. We, and then look here at this, we can see here that there's these small blue cells, these are actually lymphocytes. So it, whenever we have a nodule in the soft tissue that's in a lymph node rich region, like the axilla or the groin, you always have to ask yourself the question, could this be a tumor replacing a lymph node and therefore a metastasis? And in fact, that's what the scenario is here. This is a, a lymph node that's almost completely replaced by tumor and um, has rhabdoid cytology. INI1 is retained here, keratin is negative. If you could also think of uh, rhabdomyosarcoma. Some of them have rhabdoid looking cells, particularly like the epithelioid type of rhabdomyosarcoma, very rare to see in the skin, but you can sometimes uh, see it in the skin and also the soft tissue. And those are gonna be, they're gonna have retained INI1. They won't have loss of INI1 true rhabdomyosarcomas and they'll have expression of Desmond and also myogenin and myoD1, which are nuclear markers of skeletal muscle differentiation. So those were negative uh, here. This was positive for SOX10 and S100 and MART1. So this actually is metastatic melanoma. Totally different cytologically than in that last case of melanoma that we looked at in the acral subungual uh, region. So just, it highlights just the incredible morphological diversity that melanoma can have cytologically. And, and just here in this one lymph node, you can see you know, these all sorts of different patterns in one uh, lymph node. And so it gives you an idea of the range. So anytime we have a malignant epithelioid appearing or, or spindle cell tumor, I always am keeping melanoma in mind because it can really overlap uh, with a lot of different things. And in fact, when I see rhabdoid or plasma cytoid cells in a malignancy, melanoma is actually the top of my list because melanoma is much more common than you know rhabdoid tumor and epithelioid sarcoma.
sarcoma, et cetera. So um, I feel like I, the most common rhabdoid looking or plasmacytoid looking malignancy that I see is actually melanoma. Um, and the books kind of describe rhabdoid melanoma as being rare. I feel like I see rhabdoid cells in melanoma relatively often. And usually it's either in big bulky primary melanomas, like large nodular ones, or like this in large metastatic lesions, like in the, the lymph node or in a distant met. I don't know if that's 100% true, but just in my experience, having seen, I don't know, well over a thousand melanomas, I, probably several thousand by now, um, the, uh, the uh, rhabdoid cells that I see usually are in big, large melanomas that are very ugly nuclei, lots of mitotic activity, um, and large lesions. So always when you see these, this is a good lesson for seeing rhabdoid cytology and thinking about melanoma plus some of those other things. You could also include in your differential Again, maybe even epithelioid angiosarcoma, probably not, but, but a possible poorly differentiated carcinoma of other sorts. So, you know, you do need immunostains to guide you here, especially if the patient has no history. And I can't recall um, this patient's history. I believe they did have a, a melanoma primary on that arm uh, years previously, and this was a large metastasis that develops. And, you know, sometimes patients start with a very small primary. Sometimes that primary even regresses away totally, and you end up with a large bulky metastasis, which kind of defies logic. It doesn't seem like right that a tiny little melanoma can give rise, but it's because I think once the tumor spreads, those cells that have whatever genes have changed to allow the cells to spread and live and grow on their own allows that, that subset, that subset of the tumor to be a really aggressive, you know, growing active nodule. And also it's not confined by the boundaries of, you know, the dermis. It's here in a lymph node where it's got lots of space to expand and grow. So a really good example here of, of rhabdoid cytology and a rhabdoid metastatic melanoma. Okay, great. Now, let's do the next case. Can oh. I ask a question? Oh, like yes, yeah, let's go back to, to that. Sorry, I'll pull it back up. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, how do you handle the melanoma markers in your practice? Okay, so how do I do melanoma markers in my practice? That is a great question, and it depends on the scenario. When I'm looking at a, a regular skin lesion and I'm trying to decide, is this a dysplastic nevus or a... Uh, melanoma. I often use markers like SOX10 or some people like MART1 better to look for the growth pattern to see if there's pagetoid spread or confluence. And then in, in my practice now, I often use PRAIM. It's not a perfect marker, but it's pretty helpful. Um, and then in spitzoid things, I do other stuff uh, as well. And then when I'm, when I'm in the context of looking at, is this chunk of tumor in a lymph node or somewhere else, is it metastatic melanoma versus other? In this setting, what I want is a very sensitive marker to rule out melanoma. So usually I would start with SOX10 or S100. In my hands, they're both relatively uh, the same as far as sensitivity goes. Um, I feel like SOX10 is a cleaner stain and it is uh, not, S100 stains quite a few different things, plus background Langerhans cells and dendritic cells. SOX10 does stain other things like neural lesions. It can stain um, poorly differentiated metaplastic breast cancer and others. So it's not a totally uh, specific marker for melanoma, but it's very sensitive and it's very clean. So I usually will start with that. You can start with MART and if MART's positive on this, you're done is metastatic melanoma. There are some very rare other things like clear cell sarcoma or something that you could think about um, or malignant pecoma, but depending on the morphology and the situation, you may or may not consider those things here. I think it's way too pleomorphic to, to fit for, for, a, for a clear cell sarcoma usually. Um, they're not usually so pleomorphic, but I would, I usually though would do SOX. If SOX is positive, then you can add MART to help confirm it. But I see melanomas that have total loss of MART and HMB on a regular basis, particularly spindle cell melanomas and almost essentially always desmoplastic melanomas. And then also big bulky melanoma mets like this often begin to de-differentiate and lose their melanocytic marker expression, either partially or completely. So, um, you know, a, a big, ugly epithelioid melanoma usually will have some MART left in it somewhere, but it can have big zones of loss. So like on a core needle biopsy, MART can be totally negative, and uh, especially in spindled melanoma. I see that all the time, and then people are you know, always like, thinking it's going to be a neural tumor or something like that, and usually it's just a spindle melanoma. So it's kind of complicated, but that's basically my, my kind of basic approach. And I actually have a video about um, uh, melanocytic immunostains. It doesn't include how I approach PRAIM, but it kind of goes through SOX, S100, HMB, and MART and talks about how I use them and in what situations I use them or don't use them. And I've got like a little table in that video that I show. It's a table from my Dermpath Survival Guide book, but you can check that out. It's on YouTube and Kiko. Uh, just look up at like mel melanocytic immunohistochemistry and it should pop right up. And that has a, a more detailed table than, than what I just mentioned. So any other questions? 
What are your thoughts on Pram and its incorporation here today? So I use Prame um, in uh, the setting of, of a, a primary uh, like skin lesion where I'm trying to decide, I know it's melanocytic, and I'm trying to decide if it's uh, an atypical nevus or a melanoma. Uh, Prame can be helpful there that if it's strongly positive or, or the positive in the majority of cells, it can either tip me over the edge from calling something atypical proliferation, I'm not sure, to calling it just outright melanoma, or it can at least raise enough concern that I share it with my colleagues or maybe do molecular testing. It depends on the situation. Um, if it's negative, it's reassuring, but there are melanomas that are sometimes prime negative. So it's not a perfect stain, but it's pretty helpful in select situations. I don't do it on everything. I personally don't ever use it on metastatic lesions because here I know this is malignant. All I'm trying to figure out now is is this tumor melanocytic differentiation or is it carcinoma or something else, right? I can see by the cytology, the mitoses, and the fact that it's replacing a lymph node that we're dealing with cancer here. So PRAIM, I think, is helpful for trying to help us decide cancer versus not cancer in melanocytic lesions. Here, the cancer question's answer. The question now I have is, is it melanocytic versus other type of cancer? So that I wouldn't use PRAIM in this setting, but I do find it helpful in skin biopsies. Anything else before we move on? Um, no, not really. Oh, the question, I'm sorry, I, I need to repeat these for online. Uh, the question is in skin excisions, um, do I find PRAIM helpful if I'm trying to decide is there some focal residual melanoma like melanoma in situ versus background hyperplasia, like maybe like you'd see in, a, in an excision of lentigo maligna on sun damaged skin. I don't because I feel like you can see some scattered prame in the background skin, particularly I've heard in I've heard from other derm paths who I respect who have said that in sun damaged skin, especially some of those single cell hyperplasia can have some prame positivity. So I personally feel like it can potentially uh, cause excess angst, maybe. Um, and then uh, the you know like what do you do if you find one prame positive cell at the margin? Do you call it positive? Do you not? I don't know. I don't know if there's a known answer to that yet. It also may be for the fact that for eight years of my practice, I did not have access to PRAME regularly. And so I got used to evaluating those kinds of margins just based on H&E. Plus, if I needed, sometimes I'd use SOX or MART1. So uh, it may be different if I would have you know, used that from day one. But I personally don't. And also the other thing is on a skin excision, I'm not really worried if there's focal residual melanoma in situ versus hyperplasia. I just pick one and move on unless margins are involved, right? Because otherwise, deciding if there's you know a few little cells of residual melanoma in situ next to a biopsy site when a patient already has a known invasive melanoma, it matters 0% for patient care, right? The only thing that matters is, is there invasion? If we had an in situ, is there invasion on the excision? Or if we had an invasive melanoma, is there deeper invasion or more atypical features or high risk features like nerve invasion? Are there more, something worse prognostically on the excision than that was present on the biopsy? And then also, are the margins negative? And if I can answer those questions, then I'm not too worried about, I see sometimes people do multiple stains on excisions where the margins are obviously clear. And I personally, I just don't feel any need to do that because I don't feel like it adds any, any value to patient care. So that's my approach. And I'm sure others may differ, but that's how I approach it. Um, right. For the search path folks out there, we um, also use Prame on lymph nodes when we're trying to decide or just add support to is it a subcapsular nevus versus metastatic melanoma. So I, did, I pondered whether to bring that up is if you're looking in a lymph node uh, and trying to decide is this capsular uh, nevus versus metastatic melanoma, that Prame could potentially be helpful there. And other people have advocated for using like HMV45 in that setting, which is going to often be negative in a capsular nevus and, and have patchy positive in a melanoma. I would say that with practice, most cases um, of a capsular nevus versus melanoma can usually be resolved on H&E most of the time based on the way the cells look and how they're arranged. If they're completely bland cells embedded in a linear fashion in the collagen of the capsule, then that to me, that's got to be a, a nevus. It, Problems do arise that sometimes you get cells that are sitting what look like in the parenchyma and you can't tell are they really in the parenchyma or do they connect to a little septum that's stretching down from the capsule. So, and I've seen some bulky like nodal nevi that look kind of scary. And so in those settings, for sure, there are certainly times where, where I've stained them and, and my colleagues have stained them as well. And yeah, I think Prame could potentially help you out if you're struggling with the case like that. Great questions. You guys are an awesome audience. I might, I might be with you till one o'clock, but, but, or whatever it is an hour late on your time. But Hey, I'm, I am totally fine with that. I just don't want to make you guys late for clinic or anything.
All right. Any other questions about this or about melanocytic stuff before we move on? So I could talk about this stuff all day. Okay. Hearing silence, we shall move on. And you can always tweet at me if you got a question later that, that's keeping you up at night, okay?